Hi guys, welcome back to Tech on Toast. And this week we are very lucky to be joined by Alison Page, founder and chief product officer at Seven Rooms. And uh, it's half three over here, half two over here. What time is it over there, Alison? It's 9.30 a.m. 9.30. And where, where yeah. are you calling in from today? I'm calling in from New York. New York, very nice. Yeah, so, yeah I'm a bit jealous. But And how are you anyway? <laughs> I'm great. I'm doing great. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm okay. It's the weekend, right? So uh, things are looking good. We made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So before we get into Seven Rooms, which is a fantastic platform, tell us a little bit about you and your career. How did you end up um, at this point? Yeah, so I started a hospitality tech company having zero background in hospitality or tech. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was a finance major. I was working in investment banking after college. Uh, that's actually where I met my co-founder, Joel. We shared a cubicle wall at Credit Suisse. And, <laughs> you know, we were just like working crazy banking hours um, and we were, you know, playing around with all these like side hustles to try and figure out how we can get out of banking. Um, and so one thing we kind of stumbled upon was when we were working in finance, we tended to go to the same restaurants all the time that were either right around the office um, or we knew it would be a great experience to take customers to. Um, and we noticed that even when we went back to these places over and over again with our corporate cards, by the way, we, we weren't paying for these dinners, um, you know, they, they never remembered who we were. And yeah. we're like, how, how is this possible? Like, you know, we've been here 10 times. We can't get a reservation. No one remembers us. No one remembers we were buying big bottles of wine here. Um, you know, how, how is this the case? So, you know, we actually started a business helping people like us try and get reservations at these like top, top high-end restaurants um, and nightclubs as well. And, you know, it it was like, it wasn't a good business model because those places do not need help getting customers. Yeah. Right. Like they, they have their books full. They have a waiting list a mile long. Like there is no business there. Right. Um, so we kind of wrote that one off as like a learning experience, but it, that's what got our foot in the door in hospitality, which was really interesting. We started talking to a lot of operators, looking into the systems that they were using. And we were like, you know what? The actual problem isn't that people can't get reservations. The actual problem is that these restaurants don't know who these people are. They have no data on their customers. They have no idea who's walking in and out of their restaurants. And, you know, we saw data penetrate every other industry at that time. Um, you saw the way, you know, the way we listen to music has changed. The way we order car service has changed. It's just, you know, everything was moving in that direction. And we, we saw the restaurant industry completely missing, um, you know, this thing called data, which in my opinion is so important to delivering a great hospitality experience. Um, so we're like, okay, th that's an idea that actually has legs. Uh, you know, maybe we should go and pursue that. And that's exactly what we did. Um, so the company started focused really around, um, I think using the word CRM is too generous for where Seven Rooms started. Um, I would say it was like a bootleg CRM. Uh, you know, where people were just like entering notes manually about guests to try and like track their VIPs. Um, but, you know, as the company has grown, that core value proposition has never changed. The the data is still at the center of every single thing that we do, um, even though, you know, perhaps today it's completely automated and, you know, you don't have to, to collect this data in a manual way. Um, but that's certainly where it started. Yeah, it's interesting because the essence of hospitality, and I worked a bit at times over in the States in Boston, um, and uh, the corner bar mentality, you guys used to call it, where you walk in the bar and kind of, you know, the pint swings down the bar top right into your hand because they know it's the you The cheers effect. In. Yeah, because you're a regular, right? Yeah. And people recognize you. And I think, and, and I was watching a video with you wearing some bifocals talking about um, guest experience and how we don't look up. We're constantly looking down at screens right. or tablets, whatever. And I think that connection piece is really interesting. And, and that's what you guys are doing, right? Because you're kind of connecting information we didn't know about the guest in, into the businesses that maybe individuals held it in the past, but now it's out there, right? Yeah, so it's not just connecting it. It's actually putting it in the places that it's most useful because I talk to a lot of operators that are like, oh yeah, we have data. And I'm just like, all right, where is it? And it's kind of like cobbled together in like seven spreadsheets on a computer in the back office of a restaurant somewhere. And it's not really useful, right? Like if you if you have the data, but you're not putting it to work, what's the point of even collecting it? So I think what Seven Rooms does that's really different is not only do we help automate the collection of that data, but we put it at the front of house. We put it in the host's hands, in the server's hands, in the manager's hands at the right at the right moments in time so that they can really deliver that personalized experience. 
Uh, what do you think operates? Because they, they're now using the data. That's what you're talking about, aren't you? Because they had data and the pandemic, we gathered so much data through yeah. online ordering, mobile ordering, whatever you want to call it. And um, how are they actually using that data now to kind of drive, I suppose, guest experience and and, and, spend, and revenue? Yeah. So I, I think there's two primary ways. One is I call like making the magic happen, right? Like if I know something about you, like let's just say, Chris, like you're coming over from my house for dinner yeah. um, and you know, we just met for the first time and I might ask you, do you have any allergies? Like, you know, do you have any dietary restrictions or preferences? Uh, what kind of wine do you like to drink? Or maybe you're a, a bourbon guy, Chris, I don't know. But Barolo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Barolo, yeah, sure, Barolo. But if you're coming to my house, I'm asking these questions because I can really curate the type of experience that you're gonna have, right? And so I think that's like the easiest way for someone to think about data collection is like, if I learn something about you in advance, what can I do with that info? Um, so great examples within the restaurant would be like, if I know guests have allergies, if I know that they're vegan or they have some sort of other dietary restriction, maybe they're celebrating a special occasion. It's great to know that, you know, couples coming in for an anniversary, for instance, um, and we help collect all that information pre-arrival, right? Yeah. Um, so from, from a reservations perspective, there's actually a huge advantage to getting that data beforehand. Um, but even in the moment, like let's say um, you were to join a wait list at one of our restaurants, the second we type in your phone number, we're showing who you are on the wait list. Are you a VIP customer? Are you a regular? Uh, you know, the host stand should be very aware that Chris, this regular who's been here 10 times before is sitting on your wait list. You know, maybe you want to bump him up to, to the top of the list. Um, same thing for online ordering. I think, especially in the pandemic, we actually learned how bad the data is in online yeah. ordering because you could order a million times from the same restaurant. This restaurant could literally be below your apartment. You can live above the apartment and order delivery 20 times and they will have no idea who you are. Uh, they won't know that you're a loyal ordering customer. And I think that's really important to know, especially during COVID when ordering may have been the only uh, channel that customers were engaging in, right? Um, so, you know, on seven rooms with online ordering, if Chris puts in an order and Chris is a regular um, and maybe he's a regular in the restaurant, it's his first time ordering what's something cool that I can do? I can maybe put a little treat in the bag or, um, you know, write a little hand, a handwritten note, like, Hey, Chris, you like, we miss seeing your face in the restaurant, but glad you're, you're ordering from us at home. So there's these little ways that you can tweak service, uh, to really make someone feel special. So I think it's like the, the making the magic happen category. Um, but then on the other side, just as important is the marketing. Um, and what you're able to do from a marketing perspective when you do have really rich data on the guests. Um, and so, you know, so many restaurants that have just been 100% dependent on third party channels, their databases are empty. Um, you know, think about like when COVID hit and people had to close their doors and then all of a sudden let all their customers know like, hey, we're doing online ordering now. They literally don't have a list. Uh, they don't have email addresses. They're not able to communicate. Um, so I would say, you know, being able to collect that that customer data um, so that you can pull the trigger when you have important announcements like that, but also to be able to remarket to your guests on a recurring basis to get them to come back in, into the dining room. Um, and the, the richer the data is, <clears throat> of course, the more personalized those email communications or text communications could be. Yeah, interesting. And I've, been, I've written a few uh, articles on personalization and relationships and the basis of hospitality, right, is relationships kind of working with a company. At the moment talks all about how you kind of interact with people uh, in everyday life and in hospitality. But personalization is absolutely key now. We see that. I mean, you mentioned music, Spotify, playlists, you know, uh, Amazon will tell me what I want to buy before I buy it. You know, exactly. Alexa is talking to me constantly, recommending stuff. So do, do you see that? How, how far can personalization, personalization go, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, I think we're at the beginning of what could yeah. be done in the hospitality industry. You know, it, it, what you're talking about is like, there's this shift in consumer expectations. We have a personalized experience in everything we do, you know, like Spotify tells me what I'm going to like before I even know it. Um, you know, Amazon is a, another great example. So like the consumer, you know, it's it's become like just another day in every other industry that they're getting this type of curated experience. Um, that I think their expectations have seriously gone through the roof when they come into the restaurant. Um, and, you know, especially in like, a, you know, an inflationary environment, um, you know, menu prices have to come up. You know, why is someone going to come into the restaurant and spend spend more money on the same meal? You know, the, the service needs to be really differentiated. The experience needs to be differentiated, not just inflation, but 
online ordering, right? Like people learned how to order online during the pandemic. Um, yeah. So if I, I can get that burger from my couch, why am I going to come into the restaurant and spend more money? Um, you really need to show me how you can put on a good, you're, they're putting on a show every night. Show me yeah. how you're going to put on a good experience for me. But I think you guys over there, it's different. I mean, I worked for the Hard Rock for seven or eight years and had a lot of time over in the States. And I think it, it is different over there. The experience in the States is like you're going on stage every night. That's how we treated it. I mean, Hard Rock was a little bit different, I suppose. But over here, I think some of the brands have been affected by the pandemic in terms of the online ordering, that it has taken away a bit of, you call it magic, actually. A bit of the magic dust had disappeared. I was in a brand the other night and I was ordering my phone to get the food and there was just no service, you know, it was just felt yeah. like it all back and gone back to the start. So there, there is a danger, isn't it? How do you think technology is, is generally changing uh, how we're experiencing restaurants and hotels? Yeah. I mean, like, I think that you gave a hotel example, which, which is great hard rock. I would say generally hotels are, are more forward thinking on this front because the hotel industry is certainly uh, ahead of the restaurant industry. So I think there's some things that they've learned there that they brought into restaurants. Um, but just on the technology side, the biggest shift has been has been that like diners are everywhere, consumers yeah. are everywhere, and we're ordering through multiple channels, right? Um, and we're booking reservations through multiple channels. Like the consumer has very much become omni-channel, and they want to engage with restaurants in lots of different ways. Um, and so that's been you know something that restaurants really need to adapt, and they need to think about their tech stack, and they need to think about you know now it's not just the experience of someone walking through the door. But what is the experience with my brand online, online ordering, joining the wait list, booking a reservation, events, experiences, you name it. What does our brand look like? And what does that experience look like from point A to point B? Um, so it, it's like thinking about that, that cohesive customer journey that is very new to the restaurant industry. And it, and it is a new marketing, uh, I suppose, strategy, isn't it? A new like, strand of marketing because it's something... You know, not even five years ago, we were really dealing with that. Some were doing it well already, but I think the majority of brands, especially in the uh, hospitality space, probably weren't. And I think that whole marketing piece is shifting. You almost, you can see uh, brands bringing on CTOs to run the tech stacks. You can, all, the, yeah. all these roles that hospitality brands never had and had operations directors, which I was at one point, running tech stacks, which is insane, right? So uh, these experts yep. now are coming in and I think it's making a difference. And do you think marketing strategies are going to sit in two strands then? You're going to need a digital one? and your, I suppose, your regular marketing strategy? I mean, you need multiple strategies, but it, it really has to be one strategy at the end of the day, right? Because yeah, you're, in, you're, 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 <laughs> yes, you, you're engaging with that consumer. You have to think about every single touch point. If you think about like even five years ago, what did restaurants, uh, you know, what was marketing to restaurants? It was hiring a PR firm, which you and I both know that's not marketing. Um, and it is putting inventory on every consumer uh, third-party marketplace that's out there, right? Um, and so with the shift in the consumer becoming so digital, they can no longer just give their precious inventory and their precious customer away to these third party channels, right? So in order to, you know, really take advantage of, you know, the marketing tools that are out there and being able to communicate with that guest, the first step is they really need to own the channels that the cust customers are coming through. Um, so putting a direct solution in place for taking reservations, putting a direct solution in place for ordering when you have that much data coming through both of those channels, then to your point, you know, there's a lot of really special things you could do with cross promote. Like this person has been in and has ordered this dish and gave us amazing feedback. You know, let's promote that they can order that dish at home a, a week later. You know, maybe they miss us and they, they want to repeat the same meal at home again. Um, or maybe there's customers that order from you online all the time. You know, they're locals. They live in your neighborhood. Like, let's use that data to drive traffic into the restaurant. Um, so I think like the, sh the shift is causing not only um, a, a change in, in the need of, needs of the tech stack, um, but it's also, you know, creating a huge opportunity in marketing for restaurants. Yeah, and it's about that driving frequency and driving trial, right? And I, I really love, I was looking at your platform where it flashes up that you're a regular, right? It says in that, you yep. mentioned it before that, you know, so if Chris is coming regularly, it actually flashes up on your uh, dashboard and tells you that when they walk in or when they're on That's the list. Right. And, I, and I, I think the frequency side of it is really interesting because they're your raving fans, right? They're the people that That's you, right. before, the waiter may have known. Because most people come back for a waiter or a, or a host or a chef or whatever it might be. And now you actually know who they are, whereas it was just before stored in a manager's head. So it, it is really interesting. Yeah, it's a way to digitize the major D or the GM. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of restaurants, if you ask them, like, who are your top 20 customers? 
Yeah. You know, they might have this like list in their heads, like who are the people that come in and like, you know, buy the big bottle of wine or they do, uh, you know, a bunch of corporate dinners, but it's often the sleepers that they don't see. Right. So seven rooms takes the data and we automate the segmentation of these customers. So Chris, you might be one of those sleepers that maybe you don't spend a ton of money every time you come in, but like maybe you're coming in for breakfast all yeah. the time, right? Like you're supporting the restaurant during breakfast you know, the restaurant should know your breakfast regular that one time that you walk in for dinner. Um, and so being able to use the data in that way to automate, uh, you know, we call them tags to automate tags on your profile so that they can understand that in the moment, the second you walk in, the second you put in that delivery order, the second you join the wait list, it's giving them that data um, at their fingertips. That's really powerful. And are you just dealing with enterprise business, like big business, like multiple sites or are you independent restaurants? Are they interesting to you guys as well or hotels? Yeah, in, independent restaurants all the way up to enterprise. Uh, we're huge in the hotel, hotel segment. Um, you know, basically anyone that is looking to deliver a personalized guest experience, uh, we are a great fit for. Um, so I definitely think, you know, our existing customer ba base screw, skews more towards groups, but we yeah. certainly have a ton of independent restaurants on our platform. It's interesting because I'm in a WhatsApp group. Uh, it's a marketing WhatsApp group. And um, someone mentioned seven rooms the other day and literally the compliments you were getting. And I'm not just telling you, it was literally. Dig, 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 dig. Oh, so, tell yeah, more, you got, Chris. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's, uh, and the lady who owns it actually runs a company called Data Hawk. So she has a vested interest in data and uh, a, name, a lady called Victoria. And she and she's brilliant and she talks about it a lot. And I, and I can't let you escape without talking about that video watch because. I, I'm trying to frame it without showing people. I'll put the link on the on the post when I uh, post about the podcast. But you basically put some bifocals on and talked about um, the guest experience by looking people in the face. And you had data appearing in the lenses. You can probably explain it better if you can. Yeah, yeah. So we we believe that voice is a really important evolution for the industry. Um, you know, hospitality is so much about that human connection. You know, being able to look you into the eyes, welcome you into my restaurant, and I can't do that if I'm like staring down at a screen. Um, so we built a prototype, Amazon's one of our uh, investors, and we had built a prototype that was what if a server could use voice in, in the restaurant, what would that look like? Um, and so we enabled the ability for a server to be like, or, or a general manager, anyone that had the, the device to say, who's on table 18? And it would spit back these key uh, pieces of information to let them know exactly who's sitting there. Chris is a regular. He likes this kind of wine. He's celebrating an anniversary tonight. Stuff like that. Um, I think that you know we're definitely going to see some big moves in voice. Um, you know, you've even seen uh, QSRs invest in in voice at the drive-through. I think you're going to see it in a lot of different segments in restaurants, um, and it's it's certainly something that we're very passionate about. I was going to ask, is that something that you guys are looking at going, coming forward on the roadmap? Yeah, um, the issue is more the hardware than the software. Yeah. Um, the, the glasses are cool. They don't work in a restaurant. Like one, who wants everyone wearing the same <laughs> pair of glasses? Yeah. Like, that's, that just looks weird. Um, but also, um, you know, their restaurants are, are loud. They're noisy, yeah. right? And so you really need to take it like inside the ear um, in a way that's like not distracting um, that that was kind of like hidden in a way so there there could be some hardware updates coming in the future no no it's interesting and then just generally in future what what do you think is going to happen in the industry do you think there's any big changes going to happen in tech or do you think we're we kind of are we're still discovering it I think we're very much still discovering it. I think, you know, we are at the very beginning of a huge evolution in technology in the space. I think COVID was a big wake up call for the industry in an, in a good way. I mean, not that there's anything good about COVID, but if there is a silver yeah, lining. We understand. Um, <laughs> yes, it really, you know, woke people up to, you know, we need to streamline our processes. We need to do more with less. We need to fight, figure out ways to, to cut costs. Um, and so people are adopting technology at a faster pace than I've ever seen since I've been doing this. Um, so I think that's really exciting. And what's really interesting, I've spoken to a few uh, founders, co-founders in the last few weeks in the podcast, uh, Kim Teo, actually, from Mr. Yum uh, over in Australia. And um, we were talking about women in tech uh, and the fact that yeah. there aren't many, um, like yourself, founders uh, in the business at the top. Why do you think that is? Why do you think you've, uh, I suppose, that um, you're, you've made it to that point? And where, why is there a dropout? Yeah, I, I think it's more foundational than that. I don't think it's a dropout. I think it's more, you know, in elementary school or, you know, in our in our younger years, like STEM, you know, yeah. engineering, it, it really is is 
it's very popular for men, right? Yeah. And so they they kind of are introduced to that field early. Um, so I think a lot of that's changing, by the way, but I think it's going to take time um, for, you know, those girls that are like interested in coding now to actually be old enough to be starting companies yeah. and whatnot. My but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, get her get her coding. I'll, I'll I am. I, I listen, she listens to these, so she'll be watching you going, right, I'm on it. So, yeah, great. <laughs> I bought like my three-year-old niece these little like kitty girls programming books. They they right. have these books on on Amazon. They're pretty cool. Are you recruiting three-year-olds? It's just not right. <laughs> you got to get them early, Chris. Yeah, no, no, I'm with you. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> and what about you personally? So, what do you do? You got a day off, or are you, do you live in New York, or are you traveling through? Yeah, I live in New York. And uh, what do you do? Are you, are you have you got any hobbies? What are you into? Um. I work a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, drink, a I, drink, I drink wine. I, I play with my dog a lot. Um, oh, what dog have you got? I have a beagle. Oh, very his, nice. His, his name, name is Kobe. Kobe. After Kobe. Bryant, not the beef. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You pointed that out. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> very cool. And look, and, and it's really interesting. I know it's a whistle-stop tour of Seven Rooms, and we'd love to know more about it. How do people get hold of you or find out more about Seven Rooms? Yeah, visit our website. Call me, text me, hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, it's always working, so it's fine. But yeah, <laughs> and and tell Victoria I want to chat with her. <laughs> yes, I will. I'll link you in. Actually, I think in the UK, I, I, the Queen of Data. Can I call her that? Yeah, probably. She is in hospitality. The Queen of Data. We met a friend of hers who basically runs something called Psychographic Data, um, awesome. uh, which is really interesting, actually. Which is where by postcode and by by hobby, which is something I, I think you guys would link into beautifully. But anyway, look. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate you're really busy. And I know you're at the start of a, a busy day in New York. So uh, yep. everyone, that was Alison. Alison, say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. See you soon. <laughs>